What if, instead of investing in a company, you could have invested in the internet itself? Imagine the internet was a finite piece of land, and it was being discovered as time went on, but everybody knew that there was only so much of it. What if you could have invested in that? Today I'm going to be playing some clips from a video titled, Buying Bitcoin is like buying the whole internet in 1990, and this is from Red Jacket Capital. I couldn't tell you how I came across this, maybe the YouTube algorithm suggested it to me. But this was posted about six months ago, and in it, these two gentlemen are talking about just what I said, buying Bitcoin and why it makes a lot of sense. At the outset of the video, the guest, Mark, talks about how he was interested in crypto as a whole. But when it comes to the legitimacy of something, the staying power of something, the worthwhileness of something, there's Bitcoin and more Bitcoin. And I come up from the tech background, right? So Bitcoin is the operating system and everything else are applications on the operating system, right? So Bitcoin is TCP IP, let's say not even an operating system, it's a protocol. Bitcoin is like a, that complete shift in approach, that regime change in the architecture of money itself that changes everything and makes all that other stuff possible. It'd be kind of like if you could invest in matter itself. That would be a much better investment than picking, oh, maybe lumber will do well, and, and maybe it will for a time, or, oh, maybe I should get into copper because maybe more people are going to need copper pipes here soon, and maybe it would for a time, or, oh, uh, maybe I should try and find some petroleum company that does some new innovative things because they're going to be coming out with a new way to make pipes, and maybe I should sell out my copper holdings because the copper price is going to go down as people transition to the new lighter weight plastic pipes, and, and yeah, you could play all of those games. And, and they, it might work out. It's going to take a lot of heartache. It's going to take a lot of mental energy to try and figure all those things out. Or, or you could just invest in matter itself. And then no matter what is made, eh, no pun intended, it's going to be used. You know that if there's lumber, your matter is going to be used. You know if it's copper pipes, your matter is going to be used. You know if it's the petroleum company, matter is going to be used. So why wouldn't you invest in that? Everyone's probably seen the famous dollar bill graph that shows that since the, the creation of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. 1913, the U.S. dollar has lost something like 98% of its purchasing power. Now, But how do I process that in my daily life? Because I don't feel as I go from store to store and take my income. I don't feel like I've lost person. So how do you reconcile it? Okay. So part of the issue is that many people think that inflation is a natural process, like erosion and, you know, the tides. They just think, well, that's just what happens. Like just like prices just go up over time. But if you look at that famous graph, all right, of what happened over the last hundred years and look at what happened for the 150 or 125 years before that, you don't see that same decline. So for the whole, call it this, you know, that second wave of the industrial revolution, when there was no income tax and there was like a lot less government interference and money actually held its purchasing power. Sometimes it even went up in purchasing power. There was deflationary periods through that time, and it's considered one of the most prosperous eras in human history. I like how the host Dave pauses Mark there and says, okay, but I don't feel that. When I go to the store, I don't feel that. And I'm, I assume he means the 98% loss of the purchasing power of the dollar. And I, I'm right there with him. I, I don't either. But I do remember when I was younger, you could go to the store and buy a packet of ramen, Maruchan ramen, for 10 cents. I remember that clearly. I remember gas prices when I was a child, when my parents would go and fill up, finding it for under a dollar. And when it would peak over a dollar to a dollar and five cents, my dad would be like, what in the world is this? I, I can't believe it. I remember cans of tuna. You could buy 10 cans of good albacore tuna for a dollar a piece, 10 for $10. I remember that being a common thing. Where will you ever find that anymore? But the thing that really stands out to me about what he was saying right there is that we don't notice it. It's almost like we have a collective Stockholm syndrome. We have kind of universally agreed or been forced to accept, is maybe a better way to put it, that this is just the way it is. You go to work, you get on the hamster wheel, you make what money you can, and it loses its purchasing power. And what so many people have maybe forgotten or never knew in the first place is that money is not meant to be this way. Something that a few people, in relation to everyone else on the planet, can control and say, this is what we get to do. We're going to do this. We're going to be the ones in charge. That there's a Fed at all is insane that there's people out there that have control over what you and I get to do with our lives is absolutely insane. We're effectively slaves locked in a system that we have no escape from, except for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the key 
that opens the jail cell and gives us freedom. You know, the small business owner in me is always feels like we're under siege from all sides, from big business, from governments, from, you know, everybody. So it's like, okay, where can I um, accumulate some wealth or some capital where no one can attack me, either on a purchasing power basis or on capital control basis or a capital flight basis? And, I, you know, I always come back to Bitcoin. I've been invested in gold for 30 years, but... Um, I can't press a button and move all my gold to another location in the world. I can't just get out of an area with my skin intact and get to another country and then just enter my secret keys and be replenished with all my gold. I can't do that. I don't have that same mobility. The ability to move Bitcoin from one place to another location or store it in your head is unparalleled. But Bitcoin's transferability is only one of its many benefits. If you're interested in how to safely and securely hold Bitcoin, or how to buy non-KYC Bitcoin, or how to get your business set up to accept Bitcoin, the professionals over at the Bitcoin Way can absolutely unquestionably help you with all of these things. Schedule a free 30-minute consultation, and they'll be able to help you with whatever questions you might have. I don't care about gold at all. I'm not interested in a shiny yellow rock, but I am slightly, and when I say slightly, I mean ever so slightly invested in the game Magic the Gathering. But a large reason for why I'm invested in Magic the Gathering is for its playability. I can't play a game with Bitcoin. There is not Bitcoin the Gathering, as far as I know anyways. But I think that when it comes to saving and holding on to generational wealth, Bitcoin is drastically superior to anything, Magic the Gathering included. But that doesn't mean that I avoid doing anything else besides paying bills and then purchasing Bitcoin. No, I also like to do certain other things. But this brings me back to the point where I started. Which would you rather invest in? The land, the internet, the base layer itself, or the various things built on that? And some of them will do well. Some of those businesses will be very profitable. But you don't know for how long, because maybe the person that works over here will leave that company and they'll go over here to work here and they'll come up with some new innovation. Their R&D department will come up with some new way to do something. And then this, what seemed like a small company, maybe not the greatest investment at the time, will end up gobbling up two of these other companies and it will become the new king in town. How do you know that? You you don't. There's too many moving pieces. But you could say, I don't care what businesses are built on the island of Manhattan. I'm going to invest in land on Manhattan. I'm just going to buy a piece of Manhattan. That seems like a way better investment. And you wouldn't be wrong. I can't really envision what a world operating on a hard money standard looks like. It's really hard for me to conceptualize what Bitcoin means 5, 10, 20 years down the road. But what I do know is that looking at Bitcoin from first principles is that the world will be in a much better place. And if the world will be in a better place when operating on Bitcoin, then it seems like investing in the thing, the very base layer thing that made the entirety of the world better, would be a really good idea. Thoughts about Bitcoin in the future. You said up and to the right. I think that's a beautiful way to manage your own affairs because you don't have to get too particular about it. But, you know, Greg quoted the fidelity price target of some, I don't know what that number was, a billion or something. But what was your thoughts? on where it goes you know i really i really don't know i mean I'm, I'm thinking on the next cycle we're like a year and a half away from the halving a little less right and the next halving's next may six digits i figure is baked in the cake um we could even hit six digits before the halving does bitcoin ever get to seven digits i think it does so actually here's the way i look at this i i picture like this little gizmo box. I actually had a cartoon drawn up of it. What he goes on to describe there is basically this, but in balloon form. He talks about how there's the real estate balloon that's 330 trillion, the bonds balloon that's 300 trillion, and then the tiny little balloon over here that's Bitcoin that it's around 400 billion. I think it's a little more or less at the time of that recording. And how all of these other balloons, some of the air is going to be sucked out of them. How much? Unknown. Hard to say but some amount will be sucked out and go into Bitcoin. He says with the having six digits is baked in. That's $100,000 or more baked in. Will it ever go to seven digits, a million or more? He says he thinks so. When? Don't know. But Fidelity seems to think it'll be sometime around 2032, I think it is. Two more halvings after this one that's coming about in April. All I know is that when it comes to investing in things, the closer that you can get to the base layer, the better. And when it comes to money, there's nothing more base layer than Bitcoin. 
And now that you've finished with that video, like, subscribe, done all that. Did you comment down below? Keep the conversation about Bitcoin going? Okay, nice, good. Now you can watch this video right here where I'm talking about Bitcoin from an energy perspective and what makes the Bitcoin network so secure and resilient.